Uh, this evening's speakers uh, are based in the Department of Geological Sciences here at the University. And uh, this department has achieved a very high and well-deserved uh, profile, certainly since the, uh, the uh, series of earthquakes in 2010 and 2011. Uh, however, I think it's important to note that geological sciences is about a lot more than earthquakes, and I'm hoping we're going to find that out tonight uh, as we listen to what uh, Dr. Tom Wilson and Dr. Ben Kennedy uh, are going to say to us. They're two of a, a, an exciting uh, group of people who work in that department. They're all early career. In the terms of equity, I'm no longer allowed to mention age, but you will see that they are at the earlier point of their career. And they uh, form a very uh, exciting group of people doing really amazing things uh, in geological sciences. Uh, Dr. Ben Kennedy uh, in the blue, uh, originally from the UK, he's a senior lecturer in physical volcanology. Uh, he has a, a Bachelor of Science from, the, from Leicester University in the UK and a Master of Science and a PhD from McGill University in Montreal in Canada. Uh, his list of research interests is impressive field-based and experimental volcanology, petrology, geochemistry of igneous rocks, lava dome and explosive volcanism, caldera formation, supervolcanic eruptions and magma chamber dynamics, hazards and monitoring of acute volcanoes and geoscience education. And that's just for starters. Uh, he has a, a fair number of, of articles, of book chapters and of, of conference presentations already under his belt at this stage in his career. And uh, I asked each of the guys to give me one humanizing factor about them. And Ben told me that he's the father of a one and a half year old son. And that probably says why he's interested in volcanology. Uh, we then come to Dr. Tom Wilson. Uh, Tom uh, is uh, from here in New Zealand. And he's a lecturer in hazards and disaster management. Uh, his qualifications are here from uh, our own fair university. He has a Bachelor of Science Honours and a PhD, uh, both from the University of Canterbury. Uh, his research interests are natural hazard and risk assessment, with special interest in volcanic eruptions, impacts of natural hazards to critical infrastructure and primary industries, community resilience to natural hazards, evacuation and loss modelling using geospatial platforms in geos uh, uh, geographic information systems. Again, an impressive range of reports, conference papers, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, Tom's uh, uh, humanizing factor is the fact that he managed to become a proud property owner just a few days before the, the first earthquake. So uh, that is doubtless giving him challenges as well. I'm not going to say any more other than to welcome Ben and Tom and really look forward uh, to what you're going to, to uh, say to us this evening uh, when we uh, actually come to the topic of the evening, which is, what, uh, what if uh, Mount Tungarero were to uh, explode big time? Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, I was a bit disappointed you didn't call me and Tom volcanologists, because that's, that's what we like to refer to ourselves, because it sounds cool. And, and hopefully that's one of our aims of the talk this evening, is to get you guys an experience of what it's like to be a volcanologist and the type of work that volcanologists do. Um, another aim that we're going to try and do is get you guys involved in discussing um, what happened at Tongariro on August the 6th and what might happen in the future, and to throw you guys into the future and imagine what are the possible impacts and consequences for New Zealand if um, Tongariro really did erupt big time. And these are a couple of pictures that um, one of our students, Dan Hill, who's here, um, made imagining what Tongariro might look like if it erupted big time. Um, this is actually what, more like what actually happened, which is in the middle of the night, a very small ash cloud appeared, possibly a faint glow. So you can see the, the contrast um, straight away. So first of all, why is Tongariro a volcano? So Tongariro is a volcano because New Zealand sits on a plate boundary. There are two tectonic plates and they're colliding. Um, and up in the North Island here, one of those tectonic plates is going down underneath the other one. As that, and I think we've got a little video um, that will just illustrate this. So here you go, here you've got one tectonic plate. Some awesome graphics. You've got one tectonic plate and it's going down towards um, the Earth's interior, where it's getting hotter. As it's getting hotter, 
This causes the area above the tectonic plate to melt and to generate magma. This magma, because it's hot and buoyant, rises up to the surface, reaches the volcano, reaches the volcano and erupts. And, this is, and it's the eruption of, the, of that um, magma that builds the sides of the volcano and produces these awesome sites that, um, that we as volcanologists and probably you all absolutely love to check out because they're just cool. <laughs> okay, so that's why we've got a volcano there. So what do New Zealanders do? What do, what do volcanologists in New Zealand do? Okay, so we've subdivided us into three types. So we've got the first type, um, the first type which is like me. So I walk around, I get, I walk around with my hammer and like all the undergrads, I've got my mat board and I go around and I'm, a, I'm doing my, make, picking up rocks and making maps and hitting rocks with a hammer. And we're trying to work out what happened at volcanoes um, before. So you're looking at what rocks are there, how did they get there, trying to understand um, about those rocks. And then we'll, you know, we'll go back to the lab, we'll, you know, we'll put on our, our, our safety glasses, um, if you're me or Felix, you'll take those rocks, you'll put them in the oven, you'll melt them, you'll try and recreate magma, you'll try and understand what happened. Get your hand lens out and you look very, very carefully at the, at the rocks and try and work out what's going on. And this is what um, I do on a, on a kind of, on a yearly basis. The second type um, are probably a lot smarter than me. These are the guys that work at GNS. Um, these guys are geophysicists mainly. Um, they have a much better understanding of the physics of the Earth and how machines work and how you can use machines to interpret what's going on inside the Earth. So they're monitoring the volcanoes um, and they're seeing what's happening. And then the third type is like Tom. I'll let Tom say what, what he does. So my role is, uh, as a volcanologist is to understand what the consequences... Sorry, am I not plugged in? How's that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So what I'm looking at is the consequences of volcanic eruptions on society. So what we're looking at is the eruptive products which are produced, how they might impact or influence the, uh, the critical infrastructure systems or, or humans themselves. So a little bit like Ben, we get an opportunity to uh, travel all around the world and look at all sorts of different case studies of uh, different types of eruptions. Okay, so here you can see um, New Zealand. And most of the volcanoes um, in New Zealand are here in the Tau Taupo Volcanic Zone. And that's because the subducting plate is going underneath New Zealand here and the volcanoes are erupting up here. There's also Taranaki, which is out um, a little bit off. And there's some volcanoes up here in the, in the north. And there are some volcanic islands that are volcanoes that are also the responsibility of um, GNS and New Zealand to, to monitor. And these are also related to that same two plates um, colliding and one plate subducting under the other. So this is what um, volc volcanologists uh, do in New Zealand. So unfortunately we don't get to do too much of this. This is Piers Brosnan in Dante's Peak and he dashes off and rescues glamorous women from near-death experiences. And this is kind of how volcanologists are um, displayed in the, in the media. We don't really get to do get to do much of that. Although Tom did tell me he, he has driven around in a car and had it um, blocked by ash. So Tom's nearly Piers Brosnan. So Tongariro itself. Um, Tongariro, from a volcanologist's point of view, is, has, he's been rather overshadowed by his, his more angry brothers, so Ruapehu and White Island and these other volcanoes that have erupted more frequently um, and grabbed more of the media. And, and as a volcanologist, we were much more worried about Ruapehu and White Island. So when Tongariro started doing things, we, um, we were all a little surprised. But if you actually look at the eruption history, this, so this is what you have to think about if you're a volcanologist. How often does the volcano erupt? When it does erupt, how big is it? And then, is it doing anything now? So, you know, what's its medical history? Is, have, have people been monitoring him? Has it been showing signs of unrest? So, Tongariro, um, Tongariro erupted 130 times in the last 4,000 years. So that's actually quite a lot, although most of those were Narahui and not from uh, the Tongariro end of the, of the complex. Um, there have been seven eruptions between 1820 and 1920 from Tamari. That's the area on 
Tongariro, where the latest eruption was. And um, you can probably see them on your, on your hazard map that you've got in, that you've got in front of you. And th those eruptions have mostly been small eruptions, so small explosions like that um, puff in the night that I showed in the, first, in the first slide, and there's been some lava flows. But if you go back a few, um, a few thousand years or tens of thousands of years, you can see that there have been some really big eruptions um, from Tongariro in the past. But, you know, its recent trips to the doctor showed it's pretty healthy. There haven't been lots of earthquake swarms there. There haven't been any signs showing that um, Tongariro might be um, awakening over the last few years. But in July, here's a swarm of earthquakes. So these are locations of earthquakes around magnitude 2. As, as, as Christchurch as you can probably scoff at magnitude 2. Um, but... Um, from, a, from a volcano point of view, if you get a whole series of a swarm of magnitude 2 earthquakes um, all centering around a volcano, um, you can start to be a little, bit, um, a little bit interested in the volcano anyway. And uh, on one of these days, there was almost 25 earthquakes um, in one day. Um, and they decided that they would raise the alert level. So New Zealand has a system of alert levels, and they raised it from alert level 0 it hadn't been doing anything for years, up to alert level one. So um, GNS decided to raise the alert level. So here's a couple of graphs, and these are just showing, again, how many earthquakes there were with time. So here you can see on this day, there were 25 earthquakes. And then this day, there was just five earthquakes going through time. Okay? This is the depth of the earthquakes. So you can see that they're around four or five kilometers di deep here, maybe getting a little bit shallower. And this is the magnitude of the earthquake. So most of them were less than two. Again, pff, two. But anyway, they did get slightly bigger, so some of them were coming up to two and a half. So just looking at this sequence of events, it'd be very hard for anyone to predict when the volcano was going to erupt. Okay. If I was looking at this, I'd probably guess the most likely day for an eruption might be here, right after all those, um, those earthquakes. But it was here, morning of August the 6th, when the eruption occurred. And this did um, catch people by surprise. So you'd had this kind of one month before the eruption, a series of shallow earthquakes, maybe showing that there was some fluid water moving around inside the volcano, um, and this was causing vibrations. But then this had kind of tailed off, and then suddenly, middle of the night, bang. Okay, so... We'll now see... Okay, what I want you to do now is I, I want you to just talk to your friends. It's all right, Felix, we'll just do it by raising hands. So I want you to just um, think about now you guys are playing the role of a, a GNS scientist, okay? So I want you to think about, you are now on the 7th of August, and on the 7th of August, we, we will see, um, you are now in a meeting room with other GNS scientists, and you have to decide what alert level you want to put the volcano on, okay? So I'm now going to stop talking for a minute, and you guys, if you don't know the person sitting next to you, turn, turn around and say hello, okay? Because you now are going to play little teams of GNS scientists, and you're going to decide what alert level you would like to put the volcano to, okay? So, chat away. I'm going to now, I'm in, in about one minute's time, I'm going to ask you guys to vote.
Okay, so have you, um, yes? You will be a candid experience. Could I claim level five right away? You could. This is why I'm asking you to do it and I'm not raising the alert level. Okay, so now let's, um, do you guys want to stick your hands up for um, alert level one? Who thinks that we should be on alert level one? Okay. So there are signs of volcano unrest. Okay. Who thinks we should be on alert level two? Okay, we've got the majority of people on alert level two. Who thinks we should be on alert level three? Okay, alert level four. And alert level five. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so GNS is a diplomatic organization. Um, no, democratic, sorry. It's probably diplomatic as well. But it's democratic, so you go by the majority. And you guys would have voted to raise the alert level from alert level one to alert level two. And that's exactly what GNS did. So it just shows it's pretty damn easy to be a volcanologist. You've been listening, <laughs> been listening to me for five minutes and you can already do my job. <laughs> but, um, but there is always a discussion around that. And, um, and I think, you know, so someone who, who said alert level one, what was your decision? What was that based around? Purely there's just signs of unrest, that's all. Yeah. It's such an inexact science that you're playing with, isn't it? It's totally an inexact science, and the definition of unrest, we don't know what the de definition of unrest is. And one eruption, um, you know, is that, is that erupted activity. So that's, I mean, that's perfectly valid, and these are the exact discussions that people had had. So people that voted for alert level three, what did you guys think? What was your logic? <laughs> so it's a nice safe bet in the middle. There's a fair quantity of cash already. So other things can be affected by it. Yeah, so there was a fair um, there was a fair quantity. So that was a significant um, that was a significant event. Um, so I think that's you know that's arguable as well. And people who are level four, I mean hazardous. It's arguable that this was um, a hazardous eruption. You know, if you were sitting on top of the crater at the time, you'd probably classify it as hazardous. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion to have, um, and raising these alert levels is an, is an important point. But they decided to go with alert level two, um, and, and, and that's, that's the way they did it. So, it's an interesting thing to look about alert levels, and it's in contrast to other um, places around the world, is these, you notice they're not a forecast. They're saying nothing about what might happen in the future. You're just having the situation of what has happened. So that makes it a bit easier. Okay? So you're less likely to get sued because your decision is this has happened. Okay? We've had some minor activity. Um, and, and you're basing your decision. And then what might happen in the future and decisions about making evacuations, um, these are not made by the volcanologists, they're not made by GNS, they're made by civil defense, by the police, um, based on information that the GNS scientists, the GNS scientists give. Are they pre prescribed reactions though, the civil defense or anything like that? Is there a pattern that if, you, if it did go up to two or three, then they look at a different page in the book? Um, Tom's probably best to answer that. Sorry, take that. Um, not usually. Usually, it's very eruption specific. So it will depend on what the uh, what the unrest will be showing, or what the eruption has done, and that'll be the evacuation uh, radius or, or area will be very dependent on, on what's going on with the volcano at the time. Um, there are some instances, such as in Taranaki, um, if you achieve volcanic alert level two, or I think it might be alert level three, is you'll start shutting down critical infrastructure. So the gas pipeline, for example, will start to will be reduced in its capacity. So there are some thresholds that it will activate, but usually it's, the, I think the easiest way to think of it is the volcanologists are producing a science product that decision makers can use to make, help them make their decision. Would be a, a way to sort of... So and usually, yeah, I mean, every volcano is different, has its own temperaments, and that's why they have to have a discussion around it. So what actually happened on, um, on August the 6th or early morning August the 7th. So probably the way it works is you have a duty volcanologist at GNS. Um, at 11 o'clock at night, he was probably sleeping. 
Right, Tom here, sleeping away, and then suddenly, beep, 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 And that's a very scary sound, and a very exciting sound if you're a volcanologist, because all, they're all hooked up with their, with their beepers, and these beepers um, will have a special sound for an eruption, or um, earthquake swarm, or various things will trigger it. So you'll get this beeper, and then Tom will wake up in a panic, bleary-eyed, get on the computer, he'll go onto GeoNet, He'll go and see what set off the eruption. He'll go and look at the webcam. He'll look at the, um, he'll look at the, uh, um, the, the seismic signals. He'll see this, and he'll go, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then but secretly he'll be going, hooray, as well. But he'll be doing also going, oh, shit, because it means he's got to now um, uh, deal with a lot of things. He'll, he'll phone up his boss. He'll phone up the boss and wake up the boss and they'll start, like a well-oiled machine, they'll start um, going to a series of um, responses. Uh, I think uh, Tom was saying that immediately they put out a, a, a bulletin, and that bulletin goes out saying, possible eruption, and it goes out to um, people like me and Tom and to the press as well at that stage? Yep, but ma mainly to emergency managers. And to emergency managers. So, so this goes out, then the phone will start ringing like crazy. There'll be people driving trucks along Desert Road, saying there's ash on the highway, there's been an eruption. Um, the press will be calling and they'll be having to deal with all this stuff. So they'll have to suddenly mobilize. They'll, um, there'll be a group of them, probably the higher ranking lucky volcanologists who get to go up in the helicopter and fly around the volcano and try and see what happened. Um, there'll be more lowly volcanologists like Tom um, out in his car. He's probably flown up on the on the, on the first flight, and he'll be flying up trying to see where the ash has gone, seeing if it's impacted the power lines, seeing uh, what's happened. Um, and then there'll be other people, probably like me, who I'm suddenly going on the internet and finding out, okay, when did Tongariro last erupt? The media are probably going to call me soon, and I better have some answers. So, that, you know, lots of... And, and other universities, so Massey University, they've got a big group of volcanologists. They all drove straight over there and started getting, getting stuck into working out what happened immediately. So GNS and the universities all together teamed up to, um, to respond. So here is a nice, um, a nice image of Tongariro. And this is where, the, so the first helicopter, luckily there was a small window um, of blue sky, which is not necessarily a very common thing up, up there. Have you guys have been hiking around there? And, and they did see that right where that cluster of earthquakes was, was the, the site of the eruption. And you'll notice here the Tongariro crossing comes down here, and, and immediately up in their helicopter they can notice, okay, there's, there's big craters, there's big cracks, there's, there's bomb impacts at the places. The hut over here has been partially destroyed. There's a bunch of debris on the, um, on the ground. This is a photo from James, who was lucky enough to be flying around here um, uh, last year, and this is before the, before the eruption. And it very nicely shows the crater that the, um, this is before the eruption. So there was already a crater there. But then after the eruption, this crater, huge cracks opened up. Gas is, is now spewing out. Large areas of the ground has now fallen away. And the landscape is permanently changed. A big chunk of the volcano has slid down the valley. Um, this would have been a big uh, debris flow, um, or a lahar, where you can see uh, volcanic rocks and water um, and ash has slid down, um, devastating a, a considerable area here. And this is what they, so this is um, the, the group at Massey, this is Shane's picture, and this is how he envisioned what happened. So, so they think that in, in the, the weeks before the eruption, with all those earthquake swarms, there was magma moving around, Relatively shallow depths, so two kilometers. Two kilometers to a geologist is shallow. Probably now you guys can understand two kilometers is the depths of earthquakes. But So two kilometers, magma was probably there. Magma is hot, and Tongariro is wet. It rains a lot. It spends a lot of time in the cloud. There's a, a large amount of water in the water table there. If you've got something hot underneath a water table, that water starts to turn to steam that water starts to turn to steam, you start building up pressure. If you build up pressure, you eventually build up enough pressure that you can break rocks. And then gas moves up through cracks, you break more rocks, 
eventually that gas reaches the surface and boom, you blast out um, an area of the, of the surface and you create, you create a crater. So things came flying out of that crater. So blocks came flying out of the crater. Blocks like this. This is a pretty heavy rock. I'm dropping it now from about 50 centimeters. Some of these things were, were probably going up to a kilometer in the air and landing, and bigger blocks than this. There's a few bombs. I probably won't. Well, Tom, do you want to drop that and take responsibility if it makes a hole in the floor? Close your eyes, Paul. <laughs> 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 so, bigger blocks falling, okay? And these were falling within a couple of kilometers of the, um, of the volcano. And some of them were falling, as you'll see in later pictures, through the, um, through the roof of the hut and all onto the track. Um, ash. So ash is created when blocks and bombs like this are blasted apart. So if I get a, um, here's a bit of pumice. So pumice is just really frothy rock with lots of bubbles in, and that's the kind of stuff that erupts in these explosive eruptions. If you get a bit of um, pumice and you smash it, okay, that's ash, okay. This is how you make volcanic ash. You just have frothy rock, you smash it up into small pieces, sub-sand sized pieces, and that is, um, that's, that's volcanic ash. And there was a lot of this blowing around. And volcanic ash um, is very sharp and has, has health issues that Tom will talk about. And maybe Tom can take over now. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so... As volcanologists, one of the things that we're really interested about is what are the impacts of these eruptions going to have on society? Uh, otherwise, why else would we do all this, all this science? So with uh, Tongariro, it's one of the most magnificent areas in New Zealand. It's a World Heritage Park, and it's an area where over 70,000 people per year will cross across the Tongariro volcano. And it's just magnificent. It's one of the great walks that you'll, you'll ever do in your life. But with 70,000 people crossing that area per year, it creates a significant risk. So with uh, these eruptions which Ben's described, is that they're happening essentially without warning. So we're not having an earthquake or ground deformation precursor, they're simply happening uh, without warning. So with all of these people across the, uh, across the volcano, it creates a bit of a problem when we have eruptions like this. So with the Tamari um, eruptions in, on the 6th of August, is that these large blocks and bombs created ballistic impacts. So these uh, blocks and, and bombs which Ben and I have been throwing around the room, they were hurled up right up into the atmosphere and came crashing down at very, very uh, fast rates. And we can see here with Kiritaki Hut, is that it was literally peppered with these bombs and they've, they've passed through it kind of like a knife through, through hot butter and it's crashed through the hut, and imagine if you were sleeping there inside that bunk at the time. Imagine if you were standing outside this hut, having a, a cup of tea as part of your hike. Or imagine if you were on the track, and you see these large ballistic impacts all along the track for about three kilometers worth of that track, which is a substantial amount of area. This is a quite a nice image of the forest on, the, uh, on Tongariro, and we can see these big pock marks in that forest. These are these big ballistics impacting the ground and creating a debris apron around them. So it's, uh, it's certainly a, a significant hazard. Now Ben and I, were, uh, we got our envelope out and on the back of it, we started crunching a few numbers. So of those 70,000 people that might be across the crossing on, uh, throughout the year, we thought, well most of them, and we know this, is about 75% of them will do it in summer. So we, we sort of estimate at about that 20 kilometre um, track around Tongariro Crossing, is that on a summer's day, there might be about 600 people on the trail on average. Might be up to 1,000, but conservative, we'll say 600. So in that three kilometre area, where there was er an impacted by the ballistics from Tamari Crater, oh, excuse me, <coughs> is there may be at least 100 people in the area affected by blocks and bombs, which is... Uh, um, I certainly wouldn't want to be in that area when that's happening. So if this eruption occurred during a summer's day, at the height of the tourist season, on a nice sunny day, is that we could be seeing a, a large number of casualties. So I would, Ben and I, we, we really think that we're quite lucky with this particular eruption, despite it uh, 
Um, I mean, very luckily it occurred at night. In some ways it's like comparing the September earthquake in 2010 with what happened in February 22nd. So the time of day was really, really important. Okay, now moving on from the blocks and bombs, the other big issue with this eruption was the ash which was produced. Now when we have a volcanic eruption, is that this ash is produced out of the volcanic vent and it's blasted up into the air. Initially it's being ejected out by the volcano under a lot of pressure. But because it's so hot, as it starts to rise convectively as well. And what's rising there is this really nice hot gaseous material that's coming out of the volcano. These are what we call the magmatic gases which really drive the eruption along. Now the gases which come out of the volcano are water, hydrogen chloride, sulphur dioxide and carbon dioxide and rotten egg smell, the, the hydrogen sulphide. They're quite, pro, um, quite juvenile products, they're very uh, relatively basic chemically. But once they get into that plume, and start, especially with the water when it starts interacting, is that they start to convert over to acid. So the sulphur dioxide, for example, converts to sulfuric acid and so on and so on. Once it starts getting out here and it's starting to cool down quite nicely, is that these gases, nice and hot, start to absorb onto the surface of the ash. So you're starting to get these little droplets starting to form on the surface of that volcanic ash. And as a result of that, the surface of that ash can be really acidic and have lots of other nasty, quite aggressive chemicals which uh, might be on the surface of those ashes. And so that's what I think volcanic ash is one of the most interesting geological prop uh, materials that we, that we come across. So when it rains out or when it falls down and volcanic ash falls, is that when that ash gets into water supplies, into our rivers, or uh, uh, it can start to lose those acids and those other heavy metals. And that can contaminate those, uh, those water supplies. It can start to contaminate our pastures with uh, um, acids and, and other metals, and it might start to cause irritation to, to mammals, such as cows or, or us. The acids might start to corrode our, our metal surfaces and, and cause other problems. And so that's why we get quite interested about what the volcanic ash might be doing. Now the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that as volcanologists, we know that the volcanic ash fall will be controlled as to where it will go will be the wind direction. So we've got that nice plume going up into the atmosphere, you can see that here, and then it's going to be at the mercy of the local wind conditions. So let's just assume that that's north, we've got a southerly wind blowing here, and it's blowing towards the north and it's blowing that ash plume. Um, along and it's depositing out as a result. So that ash fall will be highly directional. It'll really depend on what the wind conditions are at the time of the eruption. And that's really important because we need to know where it's going to impact. The other parameters that we need to know about is that the ash fall thickness and the grain size of the ash will decrease with distance from the vent. So it makes a lot of sense. Is that we've got the nice big thick um, uh, coarse deposits will fall out quite quickly and they'll fall out close to the volcano, but the nice little light, um, really small bits which will just waft into the atmosphere, and we've sort of lost it already, but it'll start ashing out over you guys soon, is that that'll start to, uh, that'll start to fall out a long distance away from the volcano, potentially hundreds of kilometres away. Remember last year, we had the eruption from Prejewe Cordon Calgi from Chile, and that ash circumvented the globe, and we had ash over top of New Zealand shutting down our, our aviation. Okay, so the situation that happened with the Tamari eruption, or from Tongariro, was that we had quite an interesting uh, um, ash plumed result. Now that ash probably went up to about six kilometres. The Met Service picked it up on its weather radar quite nicely, and it went up to about six kilometres right above uh, Tongariro volcano itself. At the time of the eruption, it was a westerly wind. So it was blowing from the west, and it blew that ash out towards Hawke's Bay, a little bit across Napier and Hastings, down here, and out towards East Cape, and Gisborne got a little skiff of it as well. Now, very small amounts of ash fell, so quarter of a millimetre. So really, it was just a nice little dusting. But with all these fancy satellites and whatnot that we have now, is that we could pick that up quite nicely on uh, some of these images. So this radar image from one of the satellites above New Zealand at the time picked up that ash plume really quite nicely. So we saw a nice, quite discreet, condensed plume, and then once the wind started getting a bit more complex out by the coast, it started to spread out a bit more. Now there's one other little interesting facet which we uh, want to describe, is that it seems that there might have been a little bit of a directional blast with that eruption. So Ben was describing those eruption craters that we saw on Tongariro, and we, by mapping where the ash went, we can see that there's a nice little lobe out here towards State Highway 46, just towards Turingi, 
there's uh, one of the lakes close to Tongariro. And it looks like it's just blasted out in a slightly directional sense. And we've got a bit of ash covering some of the farmland and other roading uh, in through there. So that's what, the, uh, that's what the mapping's all about. Now, what that actually meant, was this really a hazard? Oops, tripping over the bomb. Is that we had, uh, the main issue was we had the roads closed. So State Highway 1, arguably New Zealand's most important road, was shut down for about four to six hours. We had a lot of ash across it, and, uh, and the police shut that down while there was ash falling. So we can see that the visibility was, was substantially reduced, and that's only with one or two mils of ash falling on that road. We could even start to see that the road markings were obscured, and that traction was a real problem. Um, some of my postgrads, we went up there to have a look at things and, and do some mapping, is that when we were driving around on this stuff, we were, we were skidding around a little bit in the car, which was, which was kind of fun, but certainly not, not overly safe. And so it wasn't until later in the day when the contractors got out there and cleaned it up that they fixed it. But the thing that we were really interested in was the power supply. Now, New Zealand's power, much of New Zealand's national grid runs within about five kilometres of our volcanoes. So all of that electricity that we produce down here in the South Island in our hydro lakes runs up directly parallel to Ruapehu, Tongariro, Narahoe, and then we have another line, just for good measure, running beside Mount Taranaki, about 10 kilometres away from it. So all of this electricity, which is keeping Auckland's lattes being produced and um, other things ticking along, is all skimming along at the speed of light beside our big volcanoes. So we were really interested what happens when that ash from this eruption starts to fall on these electricity lines. Now, conveniently, we had a PhD um, research project underway at the time, and that's Johnny Wardman's PhD, and what he's found is that when we have volcanic ash falling onto these insulators, these insulators, of course, meant to be keeping the line from uh, losing all its electricity to the, to the towers, is that when this the ash falls on it, and when it gets a bit wet, all those little soluble salts and the, the acids and, and other soluble constituents from that gas plume, they become soluble. And so it makes that ash extremely electrically conductive. And so what it does is it provides a pathway for the electricity to go along that insulator. And that insulator no longer insulates. It's ha essentially having a great big short circuit. So in 1995, when we had an eruption from Ruapehu, we had about three millimetres of ash on these lines here, and that caused a flashover, it shut down the power supply, and the instability in the national grid led to cascading failure. And one of the results of that was that Wellington Hospital lost electricity supply for a while, had to go into emergency generation. So the implications are quite severe. So we were very interested as to what might happen. Conveniently though, only one or two millimetres of ash fell on these lines, and, and it was probably just not quite enough to, to get things to trip over. But what Johnny found with some of his research is that this ash has been the most electrically conductive that we've ever found on Earth. We've looked at things from Iceland, Chile, all around the world. This stuff was the, the worst that we've ever seen. So that was, that's been quite interesting. Now, the other big issue that we have was agriculture. Um, we know that, that volcan volcanoes will affect and impact agriculture. And uh, one of the big issues uh, that was affecting the area at the time was the experiences from 95 uh, Ruapehu eruption, where about 2,000 livestock died as a result of acute fluoride poisoning, or fluorosis. Now, the ash that came out of Ruapehu had about the same levels of fluoride as the ash that came out of Tongariro, but there was much more of it. But when this ash started to coat the landscape in and around Tongariro, is that the farmers immediately really wanted to know what the chemical constituents of that ash were. So a fairly significant science effort was mounted to quickly analyse that ash and make sure that it was, uh, or, or start to characterise it. Now luckily, we, or we are able to establish that it had quite comparable levels of fluoride to, to Ruapehu and other nasty chemicals, but because there was such a small amount of ash and a lot of rainfall, is it really mitigated the problems. But you can see that there was, there was still a bit of ash floating around. Okay, so that sort of uh, summarised what the impacts of the eruption were. Really it was uh, what we'd probably describe as a bit of a hiccup or a burp um, for that volcano. But the other big product of science that we, uh, that we really wanted to produce to help inform decision making and, and how we might mitigate volcanic hazards in the from this, this particular eruptive sequence was to provide emergency managers and politicians and the general public with what would the future scenario be for the, the volcano. We've had a quite a big disturbance at the area, so what, what's likely to happen next? 
And I mean, uh, one of the, the, the three big scenarios, which are pretty obvious, is that there might be no eruption, and this will be it, it'll shut down and go back to normal. Or we might have another small eruption, something similar to what we've seen, or maybe something the size of Ruapehu erupting in 95 and 96. Or we might have a larger eruption. Now this is what we were quite fearful of. Because often when we have a small eruption like what we saw on the 6th of August 2012 from Tongariro, is that this can often be the beginning of a much larger eruptive sequence. Now, almost all of the very large eruptions of the 20th century, 21st century, began with an eruption like this. It showed instability on that volcano. So immediately, we're all starting to think the worst case scenario. And how, what were the signs that we'd be looking for? What can we estimate? What's gonna, be, what's gonna happen next? And this, this really is what dominated New Zealand volcanology for about two months and really thinking hard about what's going to be happening next. And we started to think about probabilities and how we might uh, um, uh, assign them to the different scenarios. Now, what the, as Ben described, the way that we work in volcanology is it's largely consensus-based decision making. So we have most of New Zealand's volcanologists. Um, it's a very inclusive process. And we'll sit on a teleconference or in a meeting room and we'll all debate as to what we think the science might be uh, happening. And then we sort of start to debate what the probability might be. Now what, we would, what most of these discussions uh, centred around is that no eruption is statistically the most likely probability. And we were talking something in the order of 90 to 95% to chance in the next month, in the next six months, that there would be no eruption. We thought that maybe there'd be about a 5 to 6% chance that there'd be another small eruption in the next month to, to six months. And we thought that probably there'd only be a 2% chance of a, of a much larger eruption, certainly the least likely. But it was something that we were, we were quite concerned about because uh, volcanologists like Ben, they've done a lot of work around Tongariro and have mapped the deposits of previous eruptions which look something like this. So they're very, very large eruptions which have produced over one cubic kilometre of eruptive products and will have erupted at least 10 to potentially 20 kilometres into the air. We probably would get ash in Christchurch if we had an eruption of that size. Auckland certainly would. Much of the central North Island would receive ash falls. Certainly areas of the North Island would need to be evacuated. And this is an eruption from Prajewe Cordon Kauji. This is what shut down air traffic in New Zealand last year. This is what we were, this is what we were afraid of. It's good to know what your enemy might be. Okay. So, hopefully with, uh, with what we've presented so far, is that we've, we've pointed out that we were, we were quite lucky with this eruption. Given the way that we manage our, our volcano, given the way that we have tourists and, and you and I crawling all over it at times, is that we we're very, very lucky that we didn't have any casualties. Um, and the key point is that these types of eruptions could occur at any time, and they occur without warning. Yet, we, we, uh, we still have a lot of people across them, and it's, it's about calculated risk. Um, as of last Friday, we know that the track itself has, has just been opened back up again, and, uh, but yet the hut store still is closed. But it's still, a, uh, um, certainly uh, from our perspective, a very interesting decision um, to get that going again. Um, there's a lot of uh, disclaimer as to trying to educate people that go onto the track as to what the eruption conditions are, but uh, it's, uh, I guess it's one of the challenges of living in a very dynamic landscape. And perhaps to put things in perspective as well, is that Ruapehu has spent the last 15 years at Alert Level 1. And yet we've been skiing, we've been climbing, we've been doing all sorts of things all over Ruapehu during that time. And uh, so it's, um, it is certainly a, a challenging um, environment to, uh, to operate in. Okay, Ben, do you want to... Yeah, so I thought maybe we'll just have a little, a little break here, um, again, to get you guys to talk to each other and to think about these, these points. Um, we were very lucky. And are there any lessons that we should have learned from this eruption now? So we'll shut up now for two minutes, and you guys talk again, amongst, talk to your neighbours, talk to your friends, the geology students here. Um, discuss these points, and then we'll field some, um, some questions from where we are at the talk at the moment.
Okay, so uh, maybe we'll. I'll be rude and interrupt. So, have we got any um, interesting points or any lessons learnt from from what we've just been talking about? Um, well, White Island was actually uh, active at the, uh, the same time. Is that a precursor? Okay, so this is um, an interesting point. White Island actually erupted um, a day later. Basically, a day later it was actually on, almost on my birthday. I was quite excited, and I was working on White Island Tilt. And the question was, was that a precursor? Um, well, so it was, it was afterwards, um, and they're, they're a long way apart. And the way that magmatic systems operate, it's very unlikely that there could have been a connection over that type of distance. Um, but it's an amazing coincidence, <laughs> like truly remarkable coincidence. Yeah, um, I think what they're talking really about is hazard management and making people aware they are hazards. It's like down at Trans Joseph and they've got the sign saying do not go past this sign because it's falling right. People still go past the sign and look at the ice and then it falls on top of them and then you know, well why didn't you say something? You know, it's, a, it's, it's one of those. The other thing I'd like to just query is probably about a month before though, both um, Tongariro and um, White Island eruptions, you were a, a, a number of quite deep, quite strong earthquakes in the central North Island. W were they in any way linked or possible um, triggers to shift those magnetic chambers in, and stir them up into some action? Um, so, so first of all, I think your first point was very good. I mean, you know, we, we can't stop people doing doing things, but you can just give them information. And, and it, like Tom said, that if you go on the, they've, they've, opened the, they've opened the track now, and you can walk past these places where potentially, if you'd been there a, you know, uh, a few weeks earlier in the middle of the night, you might have potentially had your leg blown off by one of those. And now it's, it's, it's okay to go there. But there are signs and there's information on the web showing you, explaining these risks, and it's up to you to make the decision on whether you would walk that um, the track. So I think that's a very good point. And then the second point about the um, deeper earthquakes. So there have been um, instances where people have made links between um, regional earthquakes, similar to the Christchurch ones, and volcanic eruptions. And there are there are papers published in reputable scientific journals about that. Um, I think the, the current knowledge on that is you need very, very big earthquakes. Um, and even that is debated in the scientific literature. So I suspect that those ones that you're talking about, there are not many scientists that would believe that they were big enough to really shake up a, a magma chamber like a kind of Coke can. You know, you imagine you shake a Coke can and all your bubbles start going and then your Coke... One of them was a mag 7 So that was big. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard discussion in GNS saying that there, there has been a link. I guess this is probably a matter for the some quite intense uh, modeling, geophysical modeling, to see whether that could be capable of it. Um, it's a good, it's an interesting idea, though. So maybe we'll press on, and then um, and we'll have more questions in a bit. So, OK, so now we're going into the future, into uncharted territory, OK? So now you can imagine you have been, um, you've got in the DeLorean with, uh, with Doc and Marty McFly, and you've suddenly zoomed into the future and you've been dropped into a GNS boardroom and you're now a volcanologist. And you don't really know what has happened, but you're suddenly there and you're put on the spot, okay? And they display to you a graph saying, 
Okay, this is, you're now in 2013. Okay? It's not very far in the future, I admit, but it's a bit in the future. <laughs> and there has been a, um, there's been earthquakes. Um, the number of earthquakes, and this is kind of in March and April, you can see these were kind of around background level, but then up in April, May, you can see they were getting, remember in June there was 25 earthquakes a day at a kind of maximum. You can see here in April, they were getting up to 75 a day. Um, this is actually data from, um, from one of our students who's here, Jackie, who does a volcanic eruption simulation. So the students that know the answer to this shouldn't, shouldn't tell people. But um, I just want you to go to look at this and think about the earthquake swarms that we saw before and think about these earthquakes and the number of them and think about how many eruptions do you think might have happened. If you, can you guess that based on the other data? Do you think there's... And so, again, just have a, have a look at this graph, have a chat with each other, um, and see what you think, and then I'll ask you guys to vote again in a minute. So, um, so these are probably um, magnitude greater than, greater, than, greater than three or four? Three or four, around three or four. Good question, though. The right question to ask. So how many, uh, how many eruptions do you think there's been during this period of time? This is actually a real data set, so there is an, there is an answer to this, and this is probably one of the most important um, things that volcanologists use in order to predict and think about eruptions. Okay, so now I'll ask you guys to vote. So who thinks there are no eruptions during this period? Raise your hand. Okay, who thinks there was one eruption during this period? Who thinks there was about 10 eruptions during this period? Who thinks there's 20? And 100? <laughs> okay, so actually, so this is, this is actually data from Mount Pinatubo, and there were 10 eruptions over this period of time. Okay? So now, does anyone have any questions about, about that? Just, I mean, how did you make your decisions? Why wasn't there an eruption uh, before uh, on Tongariro when it showed all those uh, earthquakes before and there was nothing? Until so, very good point. So, remember on Tongariro, on, on um, whenever it was, uh, July the 20th, there was 25 earthquakes on that day and there was no eruption. Okay, so that's a very good point. Does anyone else have any other points? Can you show us where they are? Um, I will, and there's a slide coming up in a minute that shows you where they are. Okay, so now, now I want you to think about, okay, what types of eruptions? I've told you there were 10. What types of eruptions do you think there were? Do you think there were just small explosions? Um, do you think there were lava flows? Remember, a lava flow is also an eruption. It's not just um, ash explosions. Um, do you think there were explosions and lava flows? Do you think there were large explosions? Or do you think um, all hell had broken loose and there were tons of different kinds of eruptions going on at the same time? So again, have a little chat about that. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask you guys to vote again. So, um, who thinks, A, that they were small explosions? 
Who thinks that B, we had lava flows? Who thinks C, we had small explosions and lava flows? Who thinks D, that we had large explosions? And who thinks E, all hell had broken loose? Okay. <laughs> okay. So someone picked up on the fact that I'd mentioned Pinatubo. And Pinatubo, which is actually the data sequence that this is from, was the biggest eruption that we've had in the last hundred years. And this is the sequence of what happened. You had a series of eruptions. Small ones getting bigger and then ending up in a very big one. Um, and these eruptions were of a variety of different types. Some of them started off quite similar to, to um, Tongariro, which are small steam explosions. Then some lava did appear at the surface. So people that are thinking about lava flows, you're right. There were lava flows there as well. Um, then these escalated into bigger and bigger explosions. Um, and not just ash explosions, you also have pyroclastic flows. Um, so we just show, so this is a very nice picture of what all hell breaking loose looks like. It's kind of, I'd quite like to be sitting there watching that. Um, if we, uh, yeah, it's probably looking more something like, something like, something like that. And if this is actual picture from Pinatubo, and you can see it's not just a discrete ash column, but you've got ash going out sideways. You've got ash going out sideways very fast. And these are these pyroclastic flows. Um, so here is uh, one of these pyroclastic flows. Um, these are these, you know, 600 degrees plus clouds of ash moving along the surface of the, um, of the, of the ground. So the, in, that, in that column, there's blocks like this, except at 600 degrees. There's bombs like that. There's tons of ash, and it's all moving um, sideways in excess of kind of, uh, you know, 100 kilometers an hour. So this is a video from Unzen of one of these things moving down the side of a volcano. <laughs> so you can see these things move very fast and they are total destruction. Okay? Don't worry, those people survived. <laughs> Those people survived, and Tom actually, as we were sitting and having a beer before we came here, Tom told me that he actually met the driver of this van while he was in the Philippines. <laughs> I, said, I told Tom, I hope he bought him a beer. <laughs> so, yeah, so these things are really total destruction. They will incinerate everything in the path and completely destroy anything that they... Um, see, there's, there's basically zero chance of survival of, of anything. So, I mean, I guess it's... Somewhere between um, 200 and 400 metres per second. Same thing that happened Pompeii. Yeah, so at Pompeii, that was, what, um, that was what killed a lot of people at Pompeii. At Pompeii, actually, they saw the, the big ash column go up, and then it started raining down, and then the people all ran away because they were terrified, and then they started to come back because they thought, oh, it's only ash raining down on us. That's not going to kill us. We'll go and rescue our families and dogs and things, and they came back, and then the pyroclastic flows came in. And it was that that killed everyone in, in Pompeii. So as well as, uh, as, as pyroclastic flows, after a pyroclastic flow, you have a lot of ash and blocks of, of mud on the surface of the, of the ground. If it then rains, this is what happens. Rainfall then remobilizes this, and this is a, a volcanic mud flow, or lahar, which ends up moving like, a, like something come, that's just come out of a concrete mixer. A really dense concentration of material. A very brave cameraman. <laughs> These things are generally restricted to, to valleys, um, so they're not quite as total destruction as the pyroclastic flows, but anything in your path would obviously be um, destroyed. So now I think we want to, you guys to look at the bit of paper that you've got in front of you and think about, these are actually two hazard um, maps. There's, there's one which is the old one, which has got the red circles on, and then on the back they've made a new one. And I just, some of you may have already looked at this, just spend a bit of time now looking at those and thinking about why and reading about why there are these red circles around the volcanoes and maybe why 
the new map is a slightly different shape. Um, so just spend again a couple of minutes now having a look at that, chatting with people around you and thinking about why are the red circles there and what do they represent. So there was, there was just a question at the front as to which one's the new one and which one's the old one. The one on the left is the old one and the one on the right is the, the new one. Okay, so why do we have these red circles on these hazard maps? Sorry? Signs where the vents are? Yeah, so on the maps there's the, the red dots and that's where the previously mapped eruptive vents are. But why, why do we have these big red blotches all over the map? It's where the bombs could go. Well, you're absolutely right. So this is where, we've, where volcanologists have mapped where previous bombs or pyroclastic flows or lava flows have gone in the past. And the, the purpose of this one on the left, the, the sort of everyday hazard map for Tongarera, if you like, is really looking at the, uh, the previous eruptive vents and what hazards have occurred at those areas. And that's where GNS volcanologists have assessed that there's hazard or, or risk. Now what they've done is they've put a little bit of a classification on it and that the slightly redder areas are from vents which have erupted more frequently and are known to have erupted uh, quite vigorously in the past. But what about over on this, uh, on this new map here? What's it trying to show? The reason that we ask this is that this is one of the primary ways that volcanologists communicate the, uh, our science to the general public and to other stakeholders, so to speak. Sorry, there's a bit of heckling from the back. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that comment. That's right. So the, the response was that the, the activity has moved away from Narahoe. So on the previous map, Narahoe has uh, assigned much of the hazard, and then we have through the lakes and around Tamari, we also have a hazard area. Now that, on the new map, it's slightly smaller scale, and that area is still classified as being in the red zone. So it's still classifying where the ballistics might be. But what the volcanologists are starting to show now is that these areas might be inundated by a pyroclastic flow or by a lahar if the eruption was to escalate. So it's acknowledging that there's probably a slightly greater chance that there's going to be an eruption from these vents. There's also all that debris which Ben was, was talking about. So even if we don't have another eruption, there's all this unconsolidated, loose volcanic debris. So the ash and the bombs and whatever. If we get a bit of rain on there, is we're likely to have lahars coming off this steep slope of the mountain. And that in fact happened several days after the, uh, I think it was the 10th of August, is that we had a small lahar come across State Highway 46 and, and cut that road. So, uh, so that's sort of the purpose of, these, um, of the hazard maps. Okay, so 
what we want to do now is, is uh, as we're going on the theme of if there was a much larger eruption from, uh, from Tongariro, is start to examine what some of the societal impacts might be. And that's really what, I, what my research is, is all about. Now the biggest thing of when we have a very large volcanic eruption is it often will have a bit of warning. So we may have had a small precursory eruption like we saw with um, the Tamari eruption. We'd likely have a lot of earthquakes, a lot of gas and a lot of ground deformation occur. Now the biggest, uh, the most effective um, measure that we put in place is that volcanologists will communicate with the police and with civil defence and they'll look to put an exclusion zone in place. So typically for something like Tongariro is that we might choose to put in place a 20 kilometre um, radius evacuation zone. Now what that would mean is that everyone within this area would need to be evacuated and probably on a semi-permanent basis. So if you're in a house, you'd be taken out. The other unfortunate part is that we can see around Tongariro is that there's these vital lifelines. So there's a state highway network, so there's state highway 1, state highway 46, and uh, so those road networks would likely be shut down. Luckily there's an alternate around the side here, so we'd still be able to get to Auckland if we needed to. Um, but remember as well, there's also the, much of our power infrastructure runs up and along here. So if we had flashovers or other damage to our power infrastructure, it would be unsafe and Transpower wouldn't be able to put its repair crews into that area. So we'd likely lose electricity um, if there'd been damage there. Now if the eruption chose to escalate further and perhaps get to something Pinatubo size, is that those pyroclastic flows might have a 20 to 30 kilometre run out length. So that would mean an exclusion zone like that. So that would include all of Turangi and much of the road network all around the mountain. Would have much of Ruapehu probably included within that as well. So it would have substantial societal consequences. Now the challenge with volcanoes, and usually before Christchurch, 4th of September 2010, we used to say, with the thing that's different about volcanoes and earthquakes is that earthquakes you have one big rupture or one big shake and then it goes back to normal. Uh, whereas volcanoes, they can continue for days, weeks, months, even years, and even decades. Christchurch is a little bit of an exception to this, so you're well in tune with what might happen here. This exclusion zone might need to be in place for days, weeks, months, potentially even years, which has got substantial societal consequences, especially if we've lost our power infrastructure and we'd probably need to get some other roads going pretty quickly. Now the other big consequence that we'd have with a very large eruption with what Ben was describing is substantial volcanic ashfall. So potentially cubic kilometres of material being ejected out into the atmosphere and deposited over the central North Island. Now this is a map which shows the wind directions above Tongariro and where they, and admittedly it's at low altitude, but where they predominantly blow from. So we can see here on the, uh, the different colours is that the red colour is 10 to 15% of the time as it's blowing towards the east. So we can see if we have ash being produced in this part of the volcano, it would likely be dispersed out towards this area, out through Hawke's Bay and up towards Gisborne. And the vast majority of the, uh, the windrows is that uh, much of that ash would predominantly blow towards the, uh, towards the east. But the nice thing that we've, well, what we've tried to do now is we've overprinted where the ash fell during the 1995 and 1996 Ruapehu eruptions. Now these things only erupted for about 24 hours um, through the total eruption period, but it was over several days and then over several months. But during those two or three major eruptive sequences is that we had ash out here towards the uh, sort of southeast, towards the east, the northeast, and out towards the northwest. So almost 50% of the central North Island received ashfall during that very, very small eruption. And so that really denotes the, uh, or highlights the, the hazard that these volcanoes could have with a long duration eruption. So it could be a lot of ash going in all sorts of places. The consequence of that, of having that fine, ashy, particulate material in the atmosphere, is there's a number of human health issues. So we may have some respiratory problems where very fine particles can get down to our lung and, and cause problems and often exacerbate things like asthma or other um, respiratory conditions. If we're particularly unlucky, and there's a mineral in the ash called cristobalite, which is very similar to asbestos, and it can get in there and start to cause all sorts of problems like cancer and, and other uh, challenges. There's other issues like external irritation, it gets in our eyes, it gets on our skin and creates a bit of a rashy sort of thing. But it can also create some poisoning where it contaminates our water supplies um, through turbidity and potentially chemical poisoning. But the, the remarkable thing about ashfall 
is the thing that, that the most injuries occur from, and even the most fatalities usually occur in volcanic eruptions, is people falling off their roofs, which is crazy. So people get up on their roof, they want to clean it off, they don't want it corroding it or collapsing it, they slip on the slippery conditions and they break their leg, they break their arm or break something worse, which is it's just remarkable. The other big sector which we're, we get concerned about is agriculture. Um, New Zealand's economy is based on it, and uh, there's likely to be serious consequences if we had a, a large thick eruption, oh, sorry, thick ash fall across the central North Island. This is some images from uh, in Patagonia, very similar um, agricultural system and similar volcanoes, similar climate. And this is nine months after a 10 centimetre ash fall. All the grass has been buried, and it's only now, about nine months later, that little bits of grass are just starting to poke their heads through that ash. It would mean farms would shut down. You would have wholesale retirement of land and massive reduction in productivity. So there's quite serious consequences there. If we had ash into our horticultural areas in the Hawke's Bay, likely to be consequences for those crops as well. Now the issues for our mammals, or for our, our um, sheep and, and uh, beef, is that uh, when, as they graze ash-covered feed, it's going to grind down their teeth, cause problems in their gut, and if we're unlucky, if there's a lot of fluoride around, is it start to cause fluorosis. And these are a couple, a couple of sheep kidneys from the 1995 Ruapehu ash fall. So this was a sheep that was grazing in normal pasture, and this was grazing ash-covered pasture, and it's got chronic fluorosis, or sorry, acute fluorosis, and it's called pulpy kidney. It's basically the kidneys start to shut down. Now the point of why I've got a great big truck there is that usually farmers demand that their livestock be evacuated from the area. Now we've known both in New Zealand with flooding and also from overseas experiences that we simply just can't evacuate those livestock. There's not enough farm space or capacity in the national system to take that up. But it is a, it's usually something that farmers will, will really want, but it's just something that the nation can't deliver. So it's something to, to be aware of and to watch for. We might also have some issues for land transport. Clearly visibility would be an issue. See a big uh, ash fall in Iceland. Imagine driving into that. It would just be, uh, it's like doomsday starting to come through. And then the remobilisation issue. Once that ash has fallen, it's very easily to whip that up again. It's like talcum powder. Traction becomes an issue. Lots of sliding around on them. And can even block up our vehicles and cause damage, which is a real problem if you're trying to evacuate and your vehicle starts to, uh, to block up and, and shut down. One of the big issues that we would have if, if a, a large ash eruption occurred onto one of our urban areas is cleaning the stuff up. I don't need to explain how hard it is to clean up liquefaction silt. Imagine ash all over your property, on your roof, on every single surface. P possibly not too hard to imagine if you've had it in your, in your backyard in, in the eastern suburbs, but uh, this again would be a comparable issue that we'd be seeing. And imagine how the Aucklanders would, uh, would deal with that. <laughs> now the issue with this is that this is usually the single greatest cost during a large eruption. It's very, very expensive to clean up urban areas and to maintain those lifelines. And it's often completely underestimated, so councils won't have insurance or government won't be expecting to have to pay for these clean up costs. But as we've seen in Christchurch, they can run to tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. And the other big one, which we should all know about, is that aviation will, uh, will be shut down. We've uh, seen the example from, uh, from Iceland with the eruption from Ilufenjarnjökull, where it shut down European airspace um, for a series of, of weeks and led to billions and billions of euros uh, losses. When that ash gets into those jet turbines, because it's so hard and abrasive, it will uh, uh, abrade those turbines. But the key thing is because it's made up mainly of glass, is that that'll start to melt when it gets to the hot part of the turbines. There's no password. And so once it gets into that hot part of the engine, is that ash melts and it gets stuck into the, uh, the turbine itself and starts to clog up. Ben's just going to bring up a, an image that we've, or a video that we can show of how the ash cloud shut down um, European airspace. Now these little, these little buzzy bee things are different flights. Now notice over Europe there's really nothing happening. This was at the height of the, uh, of the ash cloud. So there's ash all across Central Europe. Notice there's nothing going on in Britain. There's a couple of military test flights. The military are wrecking their planes. But just wait. Oops, we've had a bit of a cleared skies. Norway's taken off. Central Europe's kicking back off again. Oops, had some more ash. It's going to shut down. Uh, the skies are starting to clear. 
Look at Paris. Look at Brussels. Heathrow is still pretty quiet though. Oops, a bit more ash. Hey, back in business. And, th and that is normal. So that's how many flights are going on in Central Europe on a continuous basis. Oops, had some more ash. On the upside, we substantially reduced our CO2 emissions into the atmosphere at that point. Okay, so just as a final sort of way to wrap up, what Ben and I wanted you to, to start to consider is if we had a very large eruption like we've been describing for New Zealand, what would be the impact to the economy? So we don't want you to just think about the direct economic losses, but you, know, you can imagine from Christchurch, what are the indirect and the disruption costs that we're likely to see? And just sort of thinking about it in terms of orders of magnitude, would it be a million dollars, hundred million dollars, or ten billion dollars? So maybe just have a quick discussion, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll do some voting. Okay, it sounds like we've had some good discussion. I can see a few people have got their, their minds made up. Okay, hands up if you think it'll be a million dollars of loss. No punters. What about $10 million? No punters. What about $100 million? Oh, there's one, one down the back. What about a billion? There's one. Oh my gosh. What about 10 billion? Hey! <laughs> At least. <laughs> so why, why do you think that? Just like the earthquake experience? Yeah. Yep. Any other reasons? Shutting down two thirds of New Zealand's economy? Absolutely. Yeah, especially if we lose that power supply, it'd be a bit of a pain. Have to move infrastructure? Yeah, that'll be expensive. Absolutely. I think, the, um, I think that it's a bit of a trick question, to be honest. It really depends where that ash goes. So if we get Auckland with a heavy dump of ash on it, we're in big trouble, is that there'll be substantial cleanup costs and disruption and probably a lot of relocation, um, particularly of business and industry, etc. Whereas if we're lucky, if we miss all our urban towns, is that, to be honest with you, we're probably back down somewhere in the order of, oops, I've lost the laser, but probably in the order of about 10 to 100 million dollars. There's been a couple of very, very large eruptions in Patagonia with similar sort of population densities and similar economic configurations to New Zealand, and really their losses have only been in the order of about 50 million, yeah, only, but, uh, but certainly not the up around billions of dollars. The key thing, and if you take nothing else away from what I've, what I've been saying, is that if we get a direct hit on an urban area with Ashfall, is that we're, we've got trouble. If we don't, uh, we've got some problems with the farms, but uh, the rest of it might be all right. Great point. Yep, totally seasonal, <laughs> seasonal vulnerability. Okay, so, so the final question that we wanted, as good taxpayers, is that we wanted to see what you thought, where we should, we should be spending our money to mitigate volcanic risk in New Zealand. So where do you think the New Zealand government should spend your taxes regarding future eruptions. A, no more money to volcanologists, they seem to be having too much fun. B, public awareness and education. C, warning systems. Or D, investing in infrastructure that will still work during an eruption. You'd like E, all of the above? All right, we'll add E on as well. Okay, I think we can probably do that as almost a snap vote. So what about A, hands up if you think that's the best way to go. Okay, we're still in a job then. Whew. What about B, public awareness and education? 
Yep, a few, few there. C, warning systems. Yep, a few, few up. And D, investing in infrastructure. Yeah, lots of hands up there. I think there's been a lot of comments saying, what, can we just have all of the above, hopefully minus A. But uh, it's totally right. I think um, having a diverse and integrated mitigation um, program is absolutely essential. And to be frank, New Zealand's pretty good. We've got one of the world's, um, I would say, best monitoring systems of our volcanoes after substantial investment, largely led by the Earthquake Commission, which is nice. It's nice to have a little bit of positive news about them. Um, there's a reasonably good public awareness um, campaigns. A lot of people are aware of the volcano, but perhaps aren't terribly aware of what to do if there's an eruption. And so there's a lot of, uh, lot of effort going into that. And what's, what's perhaps quite heartening, and certainly from the last 10 years, is we're starting to see our critical infrastructure companies really take volcanoes seriously. So starting to think about what insulators should we be putting in areas which are likely to get ash full? How can we make our roads more resilient? How can we make sure our bridges don't get washed away by lahars? So there's, uh, New Zealand's doing, doing a pretty good job on that, especially given uh, our limited funds. I think it's a good point as well on B, among this public awareness. We gave you all those, those things to look at. It's remarkably hard to transfer scientific information. And you know, this is, there's been tens of people working on those maps to try and get them as simple and as easy to understand as possible, and they're still hard to understand. And so you know, it's a relatively cheap but very important thing is really getting across these scientific messages in a way that's easy to understand. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we just, we'd like to thank you very much for your attendance and for, for putting up with our shenanigans. Um, we've got a couple of acknowledge, log, bleh, acknowledgements to make. Um, Jill Jolly and the Volcanology Group at GNS and uh, the GeoNet team and the Earthquake Commission for a lot of that data and Shane Cronin and the Massey University team. Thanks very much, guys. We really enjoyed it. Well, I'd really like to thank uh, Ben and Tom for what I think has been a fascinating evening. Uh, you've had a, a peek behind the scenes as to what it means to be a, a geology student at the University of Canterbury. And uh, if you want to come and study with us, I'm sure we could, could find a place for you. But uh, I'd really like to thank uh, both of the guys. Just to remind you that next week, the What If lecture is uh, What If uh, We Could Minimise Financial Loss From The Earthquakes. So we are a bit disaster prone at the minute, but uh, I think these are all very interesting topics. So once again, I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Tom and Ben for what's been a really interesting and fascinating evening.